I'll start with a story about a coconut. One day, a few summers ago, I was at the grocery store with my son, Charlie, who was 11 years old at the time. We were in the produce section, and I was picking up my usual items, bananas, apples, oranges, and Charlie spotted the coconuts. He really wanted to buy one, and I really did not want to buy one. I thought to myself, how the heck would I get that thing open? And even if I did manage to open it, what the heck would I make with that thing? I wanted to say, Charlie, if you like coconuts, let's just go to the baking aisle and get some flakes in a plastic bag. But I really didn't want to disappoint him. And I saw that the coconut came with a little tag with instructions, which I thought was a good sign, so we put it in the cart. We got home, and I took a closer look at the tag. Pierce with an ice pick. <laughs> now, I have three kids at home, and they appear perfectly normal. But two of them once managed to inflict significant bodily harm on each other with a wooden spoon. So needless to say, an ice pick is not a tool we keep lying around the house. I did find a sharp knife, and I dug in, and I started to work. And before I even got anywhere, Charlie started up, launching a series of rapid-fire questions. Can we put the straw in and drink the milk right out of it? Why is it called milk if it looks like water? Why do these coconuts look so different from the ones we saw in Florida? Can we make a smoothie? Can we look up recipes? I, I got it open. I poured out the milk, which I thought looked really watery and sour. But Charlie was so enthusiastic, he drank it all. Not bad, he critiqued. We went outside. We put the coconut on a huge boulder, and then we took turns smashing away at it with a hammer until it broke into pieces. We scraped the pulp with our teeth. We turned on the grill and barbecued it, so the meat got really toasty and smoky and had this really deep flavor. We looked up recipes online. We dreamed up concoctions, and before we knew it, three whole hours had gone by. An entire afternoon of learning, exploring, tasting, and laughing all for just $2.99. I love that afternoon with Charlie. It's a memory I revisit often, a gift I take with me wherever I go. It's really rare that I do that with any of my kids, suspend the rush of activities, lessons, chores, responsibilities, to just stop and savor the people and the things around us. But Charlie was home with me that July afternoon, instead of off at camp with his brother and sister, because he has a problem, and it's a really bad one. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the number one genetic killer of children worldwide. There are nine kinds of muscular dystrophy, and Duchenne is the most common and the worst. It's a progressive disease that weakens every muscle in the body, including the heart and lungs. It's 100% fatal, and there is no treatment or cure. Duchenne affects more than 100,000 kids around the globe, regardless of where they live or their ethnic background. It's caused by a genetic mutation, an X-linked genetic mutation, so it mostly affects boys, and it's usually passed on by the mother who's a silent carrier. In one-third of the cases, the Mutation happens spontaneously in utero with no warning whatsoever. That's what happened to us. When kids with Duchenne are babies, they appear completely healthy. But around the age of three to five years old, muscle weakness starts to appear in the legs. The kids will go upstairs with one foot and then drag the other, up to drag the other to catch up instead of alternating feet like a typical toddler. They'll have trouble getting up off the floor or jumping up and down or hopping on one foot, and they get tired easily. I remember one time when Charlie was three years old, we were in New York City. We had been at a playground in Central Park, and we were walking three blocks back to my parents' apartment. Charlie complained that he was tired, but I insisted that he walk. After a block, he sat down on the sidewalk and refused to move. Well, my mother and I assumed this was just a bad case of the terrible twos, and he just needed to know who was in charge, so we kept on going but we walked 100 feet and then 150 feet, and still Charlie refused to get up. As I backtracked to scoop him up in my arms and carry him the rest of the way, I remember thinking, I cannot believe how stubborn this kid is. I had no idea what was coming. Six months later, he was diagnosed. At seven years old, kids with Duchenne start to really fall away from their peers. By adolescence, 
most lose the ability to walk and become fully reliant on a power wheelchair. And once the kids sit in that chair and take their last step, the disease progression really picks up speed. It becomes difficult to raise a glass to the mouth, and then a toothbrush or a fork become too hard to lift up. Then it becomes impossible to type on a keyboard or even move a computer mouse. There are Hoyer lifts and feeding tubes, scoliosis surgery and broken bones, bed sores, and constant fear of pneumonia or other complications that can cause sudden demise. Ultimately, Duchenne affects every muscle in the body, except for some reason the eyeballs. Kids with Duchenne usually die in their late teens or early 20s when their hearts and lungs invariably give way. The one medication that doctors do prescribe is daily steroid treatment, but the list of awful side effects is long. Weight gain, puffy cheeks, stunted growth, delayed puberty, mood swings, cataracts, brittle bones, it goes on and on. As a ninth grader, Charlie is the size of an average eight-year-old. He's forced to wear kitty clothing, and he's too small to sit in the front seat of a car, let alone drive one. His bones are as osteoporotic as those of an elderly woman. In fact, last year when he was horsing around with his brother, he broke his hip and had to endure a major orthopedic surgery and a long, painful recovery. He still doesn't have the strength he had before the fracture. The disease is really tough on siblings who experience feelings of guilt, neglect, and heartache. And for parents, the vast majority of us do not sustain intact how to process grief on a daily basis with a partner while your son loses milestones and then ultimately his life. <sighs> One day he can walk, then he can't. One day he can feed himself, then he can't. One night he can sleep perfectly fine, the next he needs a breathing machine just to get through the night. One day he can hug you, and then that is gone. And too soon, all you have left are memories. That is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is Charlie. I look at him and I ask myself, how does he do it? If I could figure out Charlie's secret, how he, with Duchenne as his dark, scary, and sad reality, how he manages to live a life full of such joy and meaning and purpose, if I could figure that out, maybe I could apply it to my own life and do a better job of dealing with my stressors. And maybe I could share it with friends who are experiencing tough times whether it's divorce or financial struggles, kids having trouble finding their way, a leak in the plumbing, because what the reality is whatever the problem or stressor, it's hard to cope and find balance. I've been keeping a journal, so I started flipping through it and looking at the snippets to see if there was anything popping out at me, some formula or, or recipe for how Charlie is able to live such a full life with this black cloud constantly hovering. And I realize that the stories all seem to fall into three categories that I want to share with you today. Now luckily, the categories form a very easy to remember acronym. <laughs> so, <laughs> the next time you have a problem, if you think Charlie is inspirational and you want to remember this talk, all you have to do is think of three letters that tend to pop to mind anyway during a crisis. WTF. So we'll start with W. Welcome your uninvited visitors. 
we all get visited by visitors that we would probably rather not deal with. Sadness, anger, fear, anxiety, these emotions come knocking at all of our doors. In my experience, people tend to deal with these unwelcome guests in one of two ways. You've got your deniers who ignore them, plaster on a happy face and pretend they're not there. And you've got your dwellers who open their door wide, let them in, and then cannot seem to let them go. I'm a denier and I married a dweller. So that's either a wonderful balance or a recipe for total disaster depending on the day. But what I notice about Charlie is that he's neither a denier nor a dweller. When these negative feelings come knocking at his door, he lets them in, he sits with them for a while, and then he sends them on their way. Last summer, we were at the lake, surrounded by family, minus most of Charlie's cousins who were off at sleepaway camp. We hadn't finished dinner yet when Charlie said he wasn't feeling well and wanted to go home. He was really quiet in the car, and when we got to the house, he climbed right into bed. A few minutes later, I heard him calling me. I went into his room, and as soon as I sat down, his tears started to flow. Why can't I go to sleepaway camp? Why don't my stupid legs work? I know I could water ski if you just let me try. I hate summer. There was nothing I could say to make him feel better. And when I tried, he said, stop trying to make everything seem like it's better than it is. This is it, I remember thinking. This is when he really starts to understand what he has and what it means for his life. This is when he becomes sullen and angry and withdrawn, which would be perfectly reasonable under the circumstances. I know that night we both cried ourselves to sleep. The next morning, I happened upon Charlie in the kitchen, rummaging around in the pantry. We're having banana pancakes for breakfast, he announced, and a little bit later, I'm going to town to meet up with some friends. Charlie is not a dweller, but he's also not a denier. He asks the hard questions. He has asked me, how will I ever live alone if I can't move my arms? He has asked me, will anyone ever want to marry me? He has asked me, who will take care of me if you die before I do? One early morning in the car on the way to the airport, to see yet another doctor. Charlie had that look on his face where I knew he was deep in thought. And sure enough, he broke the silence with this one. When I'm in college, if I'm in a wheelchair, if me and my friends get into trouble, how would I run away from the police? <laughs> I really think that Charlie, because he lets these feelings in, but then he kicks them out when he's done with them. They're not constantly hovering around trying to force their way in. At the beginning of one school year, he had to write an essay for school in response to the prompt, tell me about yourself. I remember reading the essay. My stomach was clenched in knots. I was so angry and so sad that my kid had to think about and try to explain this awful disease when the other kids were probably all writing about their favorite sports teams and their puppy dogs. I got to the end, and you know what? Duchenne wasn't even mentioned. It got crowded out by all the other things Charlie wanted to write about. His love of NBA basketball, his passion for hip hop, in particular Tupac, and his obsession with the twisted Netflix series, Dexter. <laughs> Ready for number two. There is no should. To explain this, I'll have to tell you a story. I was in a bookstore with an old friend catching up, and she asked me how Charlie was doing. Instead of answering the question, I told her how I was doing, which was not so good. The previous night, my older son, Sam, had gone to try out for the rugby team. Off he went with some friends, and later that night, I went to the friend's house to pick him up. And when I got there, the friend and the friend's brother, who had both tried out for the team, were in the kitchen, in their athletic gear, roughhousing, play wrestling, and fooling around. That scene cut me to the core, I told my friend. I thought of all the things my boys miss out on because of Duchenne. I thought, that's what my kids should be doing together. And my friend just looked at me and she said, Tracy, there is no should. 
Now, I'm not proud that I had to be led by the nose to this realization that my 15-year-old seems to have picked up intuitively a long time ago. There is no should. But I guess as parents of a child with a terminal illness, it's only natural to lament what would have been, what should have been, if it weren't for this disease. He would have been an incredible athlete. He would have made such a compassionate doctor. He would have been the best dad. We lament the life he should have or could have had, the life that other people's kids have. But Charlie doesn't compare himself to his siblings or his friends, and he doesn't feel like he got gypped out of some life he was supposed to have. He is who he is, and he's carving his own path. One time he wrote a poem for school, and it went something like this. My life is a puzzle, and the pieces don't fit like I thought they would, but I have no regrets. My only regret would be a missing piece. He's not copying the picture that came on the front of the box. He's taking the pieces he has and making up his own creation. There is no should. There is what is. And there is what you create with what you've got. F, feel the love. I need to give you a little background on this one. Because of Duchenne, Charlie requires a ton of time and attention from my husband and me. Every night without fail, we take turns doing his 20-minute physical therapy routine. Then we hook him up for a 40-minute session on an electrostimulation machine. Next, we carefully dole out the 24 pills, the glass of not-too-cold water, the two-ounce nutritional drink that smells and tastes like sewage, and then the mint spray, the only specific brand that actually helps get the gross taste out of his mouth. We lay it all neatly for him. Most nights, we also have to help him with his homework because a lot of kids with Duchenne have learning challenges and need support to complete their assignments. Every day, all day, and into most evenings, we're on the phone with doctors, insurance companies, scientists, biotech executives, and donors. We're not only managing his medical care, but we also co-founded and run a not-for-profit organization called Charlie's Fund to help develop treatments. No matter how much we tell Maisie and Sam, how much we love them. No matter how much one-on-one -on -one time we set aside for our other kids, nothing can replace the near constant hand-wringing and attention and problem-solving that always surrounds their brother. Sorry. He is tightly cocooned in a warm blanket of unconditional love. And as a result, he does not have one ounce of insecurity in his being. He is supremely confident in his own skin. And in turn, he's kind and loving and open to others. I would think that being the size of an average eight-year-old for most high school freshmen would be really difficult. And while all things being equal, I'm sure Charlie would love to grow, he doesn't get depressed or embarrassed about his size. In fact, last year, as president of the eighth grade class, he gave a graduation speech, and the opening line was, big things come in small packages. And just a few weeks ago, he said, hey, mom, if I was a Colombian drug dealer, wouldn't an awesome name for me be El Pequeño? Now, you may think that feel the love is kind of out of your hands. I mean, if your family isn't wrapping you in a warm blanket of love and support, then what are you supposed to do? You know, I can tell you what I did when I realized how essential it is to feel safe and loved and taken care of to be the best person you can be. I decided I wasn't going to settle for relationships that made me feel insecure. I started to speak up, and I told my loved ones what I needed to feel happy and confident and loved. I started to actually like and feel good when people took care of me. And I got a lot nicer, trust me. Ask my husband, it's true. <laughs> I started to feel the love.
I started keeping a journal with stories about Charlie so I would have it as a memory book in case one day I should lose him. I wanted to remember the time he nearly swooned over some fresh figs at a farmer's market because he couldn't believe how plump and juicy and purple they were. I wanted to remember the sound of his infectious giggle when he would play his favorite Key and Peele comedy sketches. And I wanted to remember how his shoes always, always, always impeccably match his outfit. But then I realized I had it backward, saving all these gems for some day in the future. It makes so much more sense to break them out now, to talk about them now, to share them and learn from them. So I looked through all the stories and I boiled them down to these three ingredients that I am confident make up Charlie's secret sauce. It's these three ingredients that enabled him to live so fully in the present, to appreciate and savor life's littlest, best moments. Despite his horrendous problem, he is really well positioned to relish all the vibrancy of life, like creating an afternoon of magic when all you have to work with is a simple coconut. I'll leave you with a question Charlie once asked me out of the blue. He said, Mom, would you rather live a long life or a tasty life? So I hope you'll take these three ingredients and experiment with them and that they'll help make your lives a whole lot more tasty. Thank you.